for real estate, of course, uh, an overall economic recovery is very good news for every one of us. But <laughs> I think in real estate, we saw a couple of things in the last 18 months or 24 months, which should make us all a little bit nervous. One is that uh, the diversification effect of mixing different country allocations within Europe has, well, almost gone. Not really completely, but it's narrowing down. The other one is that uh, the capital markets are much more uh, synchron than they have been uh, in, in the past. Money flows are much more aligned these days than it has been in the past. The next thing is that we also had to learn another lesson in real estate, that we have to deal with tons of irrational investors. If you look at uh, the reactions these days now, um, then you would wonder, especially for example in London, uh, where fundamentals are still pretty weak. I think we agree on that, at least in real estate terms. Um, but nevertheless, we are back in terms of pricing at levels which are pretty close to 2006. And I think we will see maybe this year again levels uh, close to the peak. Uh, so we are in the range of for prime properties back to five and a half. And I think we will touch the 5% uh, initial uh, yield this year, maybe on some really core properties again. Um, wh what does that cause, basically? Um, I think we, we have to ask us this question. Uh, that is, in my eyes, uh, another big issue, and that is kind of another irrational fear of our investors, and I think that is true for private investors, pretty much the same as institutional investors, and that's fear for inflation. And that's crazy, because I think we agree that at least short term, there is no such indication that we would have very high inflation. Fear for inflation always is good for real estate, and usually you see quite a lot of money coming uh, into, into uh, real estate uh, that, that way. We are basically a very long-term oriented conservative investor. So we are not uh, the highly leveraged spec investor. So we are the lo really doing long-term business. Uh, for us, it's kind of a crazy world these days because we do see a split market. We see a race for core product in many markets again coming up um, with prices where we say, okay, well, um, it, you can look at it that if, if, you, if you just look at it at, as we did in the past in terms of risk premiums over risk-free interest rates, for example, yeah, then you could say, okay, that looks very good, so it should work, fine, that's perfect. But then if you do a longer term analysis on it, then you wonder if you really are happy with, uh, uh, let's assume, 20% over rent situation, a 5% initial cap, uh, and maybe a lease term of something around 7 to 8, 9, 10 years. So and then, then you are wondering, well, will that work out with all the costs involved in real estate? And you can't play the game that maybe you are just selling it <laughs> at a lower initial yield in three years' time from now. So I think we are all forced by now to really look at the fundamentals. Ben, I noticed you make a few notes there. I wonder if there were any particular points that you wanted to pick up on. Um, yeah, just a couple of MA quickly. See, in an environment in which yields on all assets have been coming down, 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 I'm not sure that's right. I mean, if I'd bought a, an index gilt or an index government security anywhere in the world 25 years ago, I'd have got four, four and a half percent. Now I'm getting one and a half. And in that environment, I think it's only normal to expect yields on, certainly on property, which is a fairly sort of bond-like asset, you know, reasonably stable income stream, um, those equilibrium prices to go up and the yields to come down. And, and I must say, in, in, you know, therefore, most of, the, I think, for example, the boom in property prices outside the US certainly 
at least up until 2005, wasn't a bubble at all. It was simply a reflection of this long decline in yields. It wasn't to say that it wasn't dangerous, because when they then had these huge debts built up on the back of it. Um, but I don't think it was a bubble. And similarly, now I'm in London. I mean, actually, I see rents rising. One of the differences between the UK and the US, both in residential and commercial property, is there's one occasion on which we can be grateful for having a sort of rubbish supply side in the UK, is we didn't overbuild on the back of the very strong price growth. There is no spare capacity at all in residential market in the UK, masses in the US. And there's not much actually commercially in London either. So I see rents rising, and the initial yields I remember from the IPD are still around seven. Now, maybe that they're higher or have further to fall in other parts of Europe, but fundamentally, I, I, I think one should compare these yields with longer-term risk-free interest rates rather than imagining that you can expect, you know, expected return should be as high as it was in the, in the 80s. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, one final point on inflation. I mean, you're right to, to raise that possibility. People are fearful of it. And... You know, people make, I think, far too many comparisons with Japan. The fact is that after financial, I don't know if any, you know, you should read if you haven't read the stuff by economists Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff about the history of finance. They have painstakingly gone back over centuries, literally, to unearth anything they can find about banking crises and their aftermaths. Deflations are very rare. Japan is very much the exception to the rule, and the rule is more generally inflation. And one of the reasons for that, I suspect, is that the bit of the economy that gets absolutely crushed in a credit crunch is the bit of demand that's most dependent on credit, which is investment, physical investment. And if I add up all private sector investment, residential, final business investment inventories in Europe, and peak to trough, it's down about 35%. I mean, it's a complete collapse. And one of the implications of that, unfortunately, may be that we're, we're losing not just demand, we've lost not just demand through the downturn, but a big slug of productive capacity. And therefore, and this is the worry that people have, I and mean, it's very difficult to predict. At the moment, there's still plenty of spare capacity. But it's possible you won't need much spending growth in the economy to generate inflation. So I think that's a legitimate worry. You say it's positive for real estate. I'm glad it's positive for somebody. Um, I always get the same thing when my commodity analysts describe big rises in oil prices as bullish. I think, well, they may be for you, but... Um, so I think high inflation is, or at least higher inflation, is potentially a concern. And certainly, I think, particularly in the countries where exchange rates have fallen a lot, the chances of deflation are minimal, I would have thought. 